This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception and Action podcast, my interview with Stephanie Rossett, lecturer in psychology from the University of East Anglia in the UK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Stephanie Rossett. Stephanie is originally from Portugal and did her PhD at the University of Glasgow. She does some really interesting research that both strives to improve the outcome of people that have suffered brain injuries and helps to understand how the quote-unquote normal human brain functions. In particular, she has done a lot of interesting work looking at the dissociation between perception and perception for action, a topic that I think is directly relevant for a lot of people interested in training. In the interview, we discuss perceptual and action-related deficits in visual neglect, brain areas associated with online and offline control of action, her recent work with patient DF that challenges some well-known previous findings, and her research examining ways to rehabilitate neglect patients. Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Today my guest is Stephanie Rossett, lecturer in psychology from the University of East Anglia in the UK. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Stephanie. Thanks for having me, Rob. Oh, you're welcome. To start off with, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in neuroscience? Uh, Yeah, sure. So I actually got interested in neuroscience at a very young age uh, because my mom unfortunately had a stroke. When I was in my early teens, she's fully recovered now. But at the time, I remember looking at her CT scan and thinking that it was weird that she had a lesion on the wrong side of the brain scan with respect to her deficits. So this kind of motivated me to do an undergraduate degree in psychology. And then during my degree, I had a really great uh, professor in uh, neuropsychology uh, in Portugal uh, at the University of the Algarve, which is she's called Alexandra Reis. And I just absolutely loved learning about uh, brain behavior relationships and especially about brain disorders. So the very rare single case studies really fascinated me. And so then after my degree, I decided that I really wanted to do research uh, for a living. So then I started looking for PhDs all over uh, the UK, especially, and I was lucky enough to get funding for four years from my home country to do a PhD. So I ended up working with um, Monica Harvey at the University of Glasgow, and she's an expert in visual neglect. So that was really fantastic, and that department was also quite good. And I also was interested in the neuroscience side of stroke. So I started doing lesion mapping and trying to relate spe- specific lesions with specific visual motor deficits. And then during a U.S. conference, I met Mel Goodell at a poster that I was presenting, and he invited me for a visit at Western which again is a fantastic place to do research, so a strike of luck again. And then I decided to go for a postdoc there with Mel, and I also worked with uh, the amazing Jody Cullum, and I also got some funding for that, which was great. And my goal to go there was really to learn fMRI and specifically to do uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging of hand actions, which is really difficult if you want to use real 3D objects and get people to directly view them in the scanner. And working with Jodi was great because she's a world-leading expert on that. That's how I got into neuroscience of action. That's great, yeah. So you and your research, you kind of both interested in studying, kind of understanding these deficits for helping to solve, you know, solve the problems, but also using them as a way to understand, quote-unquote, normal behavior, right? Absolutely. I really like to link the basic research, which kind of perceived as more geeky, I guess, to, you know, reaching, grasping what parts of the brain are involved in these different tasks to the clinic and what happens when you have a stroke in certain parts of the brain 
And can we use this perhaps in the future as a measure of recovery? Or can we use somehow the knowledge we have to improve the life of these patients? That's great. And so to dig into the research, start digging into the details, you already mentioned this, but you've done a lot of work on the topic of visual neglect. Yes. For anyone that might not know, can you tell us what that is and kind of some of the typical perceptual problems people have that have neglect? Yes. So... Visual neglect is a really perplexing condition that has puzzled, I would say, researchers and neurologists for more than a century. And it's kind of classically defined as a loss of awareness of the side of space opposite to the side of a brain lesion. It's most commonly observed after a right hemisphere stroke. So if you have a right hemisphere stroke, you will have left visual neglect. And it's not like the patient's blind, so it's not like a visual field cut or a pure visual deficit. It's just that the patient has lost awareness of that side of space, including sometimes their own body. So, for example, if you ask a patient, you put a sheet of paper in front of the patient, A4 sheet with letters, and you ask them to find specific targets amongst distractors, the patients who have a right hemisphere lesion will neglect the letters on the left side of space. So they'll mostly find their items on the right side. Other uh, specific deficits that you find is um, when you ask them to mark the middle of a line. And here the patients, again, they show a kind of a rightward bias. So they mark the middle too much to the right of the true middle of the line. It's like they underperceive one side of the line. And it's not just visual. So it can also affect audition, touch, all the senses. And it's not uh, that the patient doesn't really understand the task, or as I said, it's blind, because even if you ask the patient to make a drawing from memory, some patients will draw only the right side of an object. So commonly we ask them to make a drawing of a butterfly, for example. So they will draw only the right side of the butterfly. It's, as I said, it's a really severe condition. And quite common after a right hemisphere stroke. So the numbers are about three to five million stroke patients will present visual neglect. And it's a major predictor of disability. And there's not really a current uh, way to treat these patients. So, yeah, in essence, that's what visual neglect is. Do neglect patients show, you know, reflexive responses for, you know, if something's coming from their neglected field? You know, is there a way to show that they are sensing that thing, maybe, but maybe not being aware of it? Yeah, so so in, in, when you see a patient in the clinic, you know, sometimes you'll see a patient who is completely turned to the right-hand side. So it, they won't even acknowledge you when you talk them uh, from the left. And in fact, you know, one of my patients in Glasgow, she was quite severe and she wasn't allowed to get out of her own house because one time she got out and a car came from the left and she didn't notice it. So she was hit by a car. But of course, there's uh, this is quite a complex scene. We've done several studies uh, using very simple, you know, pointing tasks in the dark where they see a single light. And they can do this relatively well compared to stroke patients. So I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. No. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a tricky and it's not always the same, is it, from patient to no. patient? No, yeah. it's a complex syndrome, so you have to kind of test many patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they will present different deficits according to where their lesions are. And I know that you have also done uh, quite a bit of work looking, going beyond just the perceptual effects to look at the control of action. Yes. Can you tell us a little about that work and how maybe the perceptual effects relate to the action effects. Yeah. So in terms of the neglect kind of research that we've done, we've been looking mostly at these patients have severe perceptual deficits. So they don't really mark letters on a sheet of paper or they, they have a bias on, a, on, on when finding the middle of a line. So how does that kind of attentional bias or perceptual bias affect their visual motor control? And there's, there was quite a lot of controversy when I did this research because when you test right hemisphere patient in general, uh, so someone who had a stroke on the right hemisphere, they will tend to have a bias to the side of the lesion, even in their reaching trajectory to a target straight ahead. 
So what I was interested in is to see how much of this bias in a neglect patient is due to having just a general uh, lesion in the right hemisphere, or how much is driven by their perceptual deficit or attentional deficit of the neglect. So to do that, we've done a, a series of studies. I can tell you a little bit about each one if you want. Sure, yeah, that would that, yeah. be great. Yeah. Stop me if you have any questions. Okay, well. will do. Yeah. yeah, so I was interested to testing, are the, the deficits in visual motor control specific to neglect? Or are they common in a sample of right hemisphere stroke patients? And do these deficits relate to specific damage to specific parts of the brain? And also, what kind of actions are impaired or spared? So in one of the first study that we did, we had people uh, sitting on a table and they had a kind of an apparatus in front of, of them where we could flash lights. So targets, v small visual targets on the left and right. And these targets were just visual. There was no tactile feedback about their position. And we motion tracked their hands. And we also used the uh, vision center mapping. And uh, we compared samples of patients who had neglect, patients who don't have neglect, and patient healthy controls. And in the first study, what we did was look at the influence of visual feedback. So to do this, we used the plateau goggles. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of occluded, uh, we had a condition in which the patient's participants had full vision of their hand and target during movement. And another condition in which as soon as they started moving, uh, the goggles closed. So we removed any online visual feedback during hand movement. And what we found was that on both conditions, we found that the neglect patients actually weren't specifically impaired. So even in the hardest condition, when they didn't have vision during their movement, they could actually reach the targets quite well, accurately. And even when these targets were presented in their neglected field. So, but what we found was that some of the patients, and this came out as a group effect, which uh, in the no neglect group were the ones who were actually impaired compared to controls. So this kind of uh, suggested that if you have a right hemisphere lesion, you will rely a lot on vision to be accurate. So if you remove that during the action, then people don't do so well in their pointing performance. So, but I, we couldn't really explain that. So lesion center mapping actually helps. So we were able to pinpoint areas that when lesion are associated with this high reliance on vision to do an action, and we found that lesions in the basal ganglia and in the superior parietal occipital cortex were actually associated with big errors in these open loop without visual feedback reaches okay. to the contralegional side of space. So that was one of the first studies we did. So, so just to, when you say uh, vision there, you're, you're talking about using it kind of offline for planning. Or, yes. Yeah. So they wear the goggles so mm -hmm. they can see the target, but as soon as they start moving, we remove vision. Okay. Uh, okay. So they can't see their hand or target. So, so they have to rely on the action plan. Right. Because right. they can't correct online anymore. They can't adapt their reaches to their own errors, I guess. Right. Yeah. So that was the first study we did, which kind of suggested neglect patients don't have a specific impairment in reaching, even on their neglected field. And that depending on the site of lesion, if you have a stroke, then you will have deficits in reaching, especially in conditions where you can't use your vision anymore to correct your movements. But uh, I was also interested in kind of looking at what about uh, different kinds of actions. So what about if you do a memory guided action when there's no target available during the movement? So in another study, we looked at either a, an immediate action. So uh, they see a target and they have to reach as soon as they see it. Or in another condition in which they see the target, then the target goes away and they have to reach from memory. So here I was interested to see how the neglect patients would perform. And what we found uh, in this study was that, again, the neglect patients in the immediate condition where the target's there, they could actually do really well. So again, they weren't producing any bigger errors than other stroke patients or healthy controls. However, during, uh, during um, after a delay, so in their memory-guided or delayed actions, 
they were actually quite inaccurate, uh, specifically when the targets were presented in their neglected field. So again, if, if they have to use an offline, you know, representation of the target, that seemed to be specifically impaired in the GLAD patients in this case. The patients without neglect weren't impaired. And if we looked at the lesions in this case, they were quite similar to the lesions you see in the GLAD patients. So they were associated with lesions, these kind of errors in memory-guided pointing. They were associated with lesions in the inferior parietal lobe but also included other areas which are more closer to the traditional ventral stream areas like the lateral occipital cortex. You seem to find different areas involved for these different kinds of, of movement control. Exactly. So different uh, networks or different brain areas seem to play a different role according to the different actions that you're doing. And we also did a more recent paper in which we looked at anti-pointing Okay. So in this case, it's again more of a kind of perceptual in nature action. It's not like you're doing a target directed action. So we compare the condition in which the patients had to pro point, so they saw a target and they reach for it, versus another condition in which uh, they saw a target but they had to point to the mirror position of that target. And here, this task was actually super sensitive to neglect. It was actually the most severe impairment with that we saw across all our experiments. Okay. It really correlates with the severity of neglect as well. And what's interesting is that in this case, they're impaired in both sides of space. So not just their neglected field, but also in their non-neglected field. Okay. So when they see a target on the right and they have to point to the mirror position of this target, they're also impaired very similarly to when they see a target on the left and they have to point to the mirror position on the right. And again, the lesions are, again, very related to neglect sites, but also included some other areas like middle temporal gyrus and even parahippocampal gyrus, which are not traditionally associated with neglect. That's really interesting. And just how well do neglect patients do on so maybe like a visual uh, tracking task where that you can only use kind of online control. So you have kind of a target randomly changing position with that. Would they do really poorly on that? Right. So we did that as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In an experiment with uh, Rob McIntosh in Edinburgh, we, we looked at uh, online correction. So we looked at the, this double step paradigm. So the patient is reaching to the target and in a proportion of trials, the target jumps. Okay. Is that what you mean? Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, and the patients were actually quite slow compared to the no-neglect patients and the healthy control. So they're really slow to correct uh, online for this target jump, but they're quite accurate, so they weren't missing the target. But we didn't have enough power to look at lesions or anything more specific about what's causing this deficit. From that study, we showed that they can catch a target in flight, but it takes them a longer time compared to our other groups. That's, that's really interesting. So I, I guess it's, you know, the specific action deficits a patient's going to have will depend on exactly where the lesion is, right? There's a complex pattern you could yes. get. In. Definitely, yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess moving on from neglect, if, if that's okay with you. Um, yes, yes. To turn to, to one of your more recent studies, you've done some work recently with patient DF, right? You have a yes. paper coming out, and and it has some important implications for Goodale and Milner kind of two streams theory that has been around for, for quite a while and been very influential. And So to, to start off with, maybe can you give us a quick overview for people that don't know the kind of the, the two streams hypothesis, ventral versus dorsal? and kind of the, how the earlier work on DF seems to support that. So David Miller and Mel Goodell proposed this uh, model of vision that suggests that there's two streams for the processing of visual information in the brain. So one that goes from V1 to the posterior parietal cortex, which mediates or processes visual information for action purposes like reaching and grasping for your pint in the pub, and a ventral occipital temporal stream, which mediates vision for perception, so processes visual information for us to be able to recognize objects around us, like 
recognize the pint. That's a pint. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the um, cornerstones of uh, this model was um, patient DF. DF is an extensively studied patient who uh, acquired a profound visual form agnosia following a, a bilateral ventral stream damage, so the vision for perception stream. So she had damage on both sides of her brain following a carbon monoxide poisoning episode. And she was, after this uh, accident, she was unable to identify or distinguish uh, simple visual stimuli, even faces or objects. She couldn't tell you what they were. But at the time when uh, David and Mel tested her, she could still use the same visual information to control her hand actions towards the stimuli. So it was quite puzzling, uh, astonishing kind of dissociation. So if you if you ask the F in the, in the early papers, they reported that if you ask the F to estimate the size of an object, she wouldn't be able to do it. So she couldn't shape her hand to the size of the object. But when she was actually grasping it, her hand actually shaped to the specific size of the object right in front of her. So this kind of was in line with the model that Perhaps she, after her ventral stream damage, she still had the dorsal stream that allowed her to access the same visual information, but for the purpose of action. So while her perceptual deficits were more related to the ventral stream damage. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And yeah. Uh, just to kind of add some. So this theory is an attempt to explain kind of this anatomical fact that seems to be the case in the brain, right? That we have these two very distinct flows of information, one to kind of the top of the brain and one to the bottom, right? So it's right. It's, it's an attempt to explain something that I think most people still accept is true, right? These two, this two pathway idea. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. no, that was, that was very clear. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, there's the complementary dissociation. So patients who suffer damage to the top of the brain, as you say, the dorsal stream, they have a condition called optic ataxia. And so in this case, these patients are, are able to perform actions, but have an intact perceptual abilities. At least that was the understanding at the time. So these kind of contrasting patterns between patients with optic ataxia and patient DF have been widely interpreted as a double dissociation uh, between patient DF and optic ataxic patient and a dissociation between the two streams for perception and action. So what, what we did, um, we decided to do, and then turned out to have some puzzling results, was uh, to kind of address a crit critique from a group in France. So Yves Rossetti and Laura Pizella in Lyon in France published a paper in which they say, well, actually, you know, you can't really claim that there is a double dissociation between these two cases, because we haven't actually tested them under appropriately matched condition. So while the visual motor deficits in optic ataxia are generally observed in peripheral vision, so usually they perform quite well when they're allowed to look at the targets, but if they're asked to do actions in their periphery, they're actually impaired. Patient DF has mostly been tested in central vision. So they were arguing that they, we haven't actually, you know, tested her in the exact same pairing of tasks if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we did this study. So we took a couple of paradigms that we knew from several papers that patients with optic ataxia were impaired, and we de de decided to use the same paradigms and test patient DF on that. At the time, my hypothesis was that she was going to be fine. So we were very surprised to actually get uh, the results we did. So in experiment one, we looked at can she, uh, does she perform as well in free versus peripheral vision when she's asked to reach the targets? So that's the classic diagnostic test of optic ataxia. Okay. And what we found is that she was actually quite impaired when reaching to peripheral targets, but not when reaching in free vision. So just like a patient with optic ataxia. And also that the reaching errors follow the exact same pattern that you see in, in these patients who have optic attacks or dorsal stream damage. So mm -hmm. her errors increased with target eccentricity and their bias towards fixation. And this is the exact same thing you see in patients with optic ataxia. And 
we even found that if you use the special statistics for single case studies, that the difference between our central and peripheral reach, reaching errors was met the formal criteria for a classical dissociation. So she clearly showed signs of optic ataxia. And then in experiments two and three, we looked, uh, as you asked earlier, at her ability to catch targets, you know, in flight. So to perform online corrections of her reaching movements. And in, the, in two separate experiments, so one run in Glasgow and one in Andover, tested by different people, we found that DF was very slow uh, to correct again. So, and this was regardless of whether she was to do it in free vision or in peripheral vision, which is exactly the same of what is found in patients with uh, optic ataxia again. So that they are also impaired when asked to do online corrections of reaching towards target jumps even in free vision. This kind of constitutes the first demonstration that similarly to optic ataxic patients, the F's fast online control, you know, the automatic pilot for the hand, is uh, markedly impaired in her. So it shows that she not only has visual form agnosia, so this inability to recognize objects, kind of a ventral stream deficit, but she also has optic ataxia in three tasks that we tested. So in our view, we think that this kind of questions, the long-standing assumption by many papers, including my own previous research, that the F's uh, dorsal visual stream is functionally intact and that her online visual motor control is unimpaired. And instead, you can't just conclude that she's a pure visual form agnosic patient. And uh, we think that the most la- likely explanation of her deficits is that her, her lesion is actually not restricted to the ventral stream, but it turns out that she also has lesions in the dorsal stream, so bilaterally in this area called the superior parietal occipital cortex. And in fact, in an earlier imaging study, they couldn't actually find activation in this area in DF, and this was from a paper from 2003, I believe. Uh, So it kind of suggests that perhaps this area is neither anatomically nor functionally intact. So someone could say, okay, so then the model is wrong. Um, I don't think that our data can speak to that. I think the current, with the current paper, we can really conclude from this is that a DF can, can no longer be considered as an appropriate single case model to study these dissociations because she's got both optic ataxia and visual form agnosia. So you can't really use her as a model to test perception and action dissociations anymore. However, I don't think it uh, diminishes the scientific interest, you know, of trying test to test the predictions of the model using other methods like neuroimaging, or using a larger sample of patients. However, it also suggests that any claims that there is a perception and action dissociation between the ventral and dorsal stream that were solely based on evidence from this patient have to be kind of reinterpreted and taken into consideration that she's got both conditions. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think there's some good points there. You're right, the the fact that her lesion does extend to both areas is t- entirely consistent with the model, right? Um, yes. It just means that she's n- no longer this perfect exemplar of someone that has perceptual deficits without perception for action deficits. And, and I guess yes. it's always uh, it's important to point out that that's not the only evidence for their theory, right? There's Absolutely. lots of just work on normal people on... I don't know where the reaching for illusion kind of thing stands, but I know there's a lot of work. Yeah. So, sorry, can you can you uh, talk a little bit about that? About the illusions. Yeah. So, so what, other, uh, other kind of evidence, yeah. So, there's evidence from neuroimaging that shows uh, clearly that, you know, areas in the dorsal stream, like um, even myself, I did an fMRI experiment with Jody Cullum and also Mel Goodell, in which we found that, for example, the superior parietal occipital cortex, which is for Star Trek fans called Spock. (laughs) So this brain area, uh, for example, is quite strongly involved in reaching and grasping movements. 
And that's located in the dorsal stream. And also, you know, there's another area called AIP, which is also strongly involved in grasping. So that stands for anterior intraparietal sulcus. So there's quite a lot of neuroimaging evidence on support of, of this general organization between the ventral and dorsal stream. There's also monkey evidence about these areas or equivalent areas in the macaque. And there's uh, TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation evidence in light with the model. The illusions literature, I wouldn't like to comment on because I know it's quite controversial as well. So there is some evidence that suggests that the dorsal stream may escape the effect of illusions, but that's currently under debate as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not just, the model is not just based on patient DF. One of the reasons I think this model is so important for me in what I do in kind of sports training and things like that is it implies that, you know, just training on a perceptual task might not hit the right neural pathways for perception for action. So I think this is a, you know, important theory for everybody to think about. But the other thing that people kind of neglect, you know, and kind of attack the model for First of all, I think the model is great because it provides you with specific hypotheses that you can test. And, you know, if they're not right, fair enough, we, we have to change them. But the other thing is that it also talks about an interaction. So it's not, it's not completely neglected the fact that these two streams don't talk to each other. I don't think Mel and David uh, made strong claims about where this interaction takes place, and that's why we need more research to understand, you know, how these two processes and these ne networks talk to each other. But that's kind of neglected by a lot of researchers in the field that actually David and Mel already acknowledged from the outset that the two streams interact. They're not just this separate thing happening in the brain individually. I think that's really still a really interesting area and. In the final topic I wanted to touch on with you is uh, some of the work you're doing with, you know, obviously helping patients after having brain injury, learning to be able to their visual system improve and control action again. So can you tell us some of the rehabilitation work you've been doing? Yes, that, that uh, again was a project that I've been working on with Monica Harvey in Glasgow. And so we took the kind of findings from the visual motor literature that the patients with neglect, so these patients who have these severe perceptual attentional deficits, can actually perform simple actions relatively well. And as we discussed earlier, they can actually, you know, get feedback from the action. So they, they perform well even in conditions where you remove visual feedback from their hands. So the idea was, can we use this kind of system the action system and action feedback to improve their perception and attention. So we were we, we decided to do a, a kind of a small trial to test the efficacy of a technique called visual motor feedback training. So this training is very simple and very cheap. You can buy the equipment in a, a hardware store for ten pounds. Uh, so quite uh, quite good for uh, the price. And basically, you give the patient sticks or rods, and they're different sizes. So they have rods of different sizes, and they're asked to reach out and grasp the middle of these rods and lift them up until they're balanced. So this is like a bisection task, like I was saying, mark the line in the middle. But in this case, they're actually getting feedback from this, doing this action. So you can imagine the first time a neglect patient does this, when they, they lift, uh, they're asked to grasp the middle of the stick and lift it up. When they try to grasp the middle uh, and lift it up, the rod will be unbalanced. So immediately uh, they get feedback, oh, I've done something incorrect here. So, and then they have to repeat this until they reach the middle of the rod. Okay. So this, okay. this visual motor feedback training is not just visual or motor. You get optic, per perception, all kinds of feedback here. But you have to imagine also the rods are placed in different places so that the middle of the rod is aligned either with the middle of the patient or to the right of their middle or to the left of their middle. So in some trials, it's quite easy and other trials, it's quite difficult to kind of find the middle of these rods. So for each trial, they try to grasp the middle, lift it up. They check it's unbalanced. And then if it's unbalanced and they're not happy with it, they put it back down. 
and then they repeat this until eventually they reach the middle of the road. So we did this training with the patients when they were discharged from hospital. I don't know if it's the same in the U.S., but currently in the U.K., there's unfortunately a push for patients to being discharged home as soon as possible. So we wanted to train to develop a kind of a training for patients who are actually at their homes. And we run a small trial in which we had 10 patients who did this exercise, the visual motor feedback training, so grasping these rods and lifting them up until they're balanced, compared to a control group of also 10 patients who just grasped one side of the rod. So both of our groups did the same grasping exercise, but only one of them got feedback of grasping the middle. So only one of them got feedback about their errors in their grasping bisection. So as I said, this, this all was run at home, at the patient's home. And we what we found was that we had some really interesting and quite promising results. So first of all, we tested them on the line bisection tarp. So on a piece of paper, they have a line and they have to mark the middle. And what we found is that their line bisection errors were reduced after the training which kind of makes sense because they're doing all this grasping bisection. So I would be very surprised if we haven't found a line bisection improvement. But what was more interesting is that we found that the effects of the training actually carried over to visual search tasks, like find the letters in a piece of paper or stars in the middle of other items. So there was a reduction in their bias of attention. So they started to find more things on their neglected side. And then we also had a couple of other small effects in which we found that at follow-up, the group that received the intervention was was actually reporting that they were better in their activities of daily living. So we had a kind of a questionnaire called the stroke impact scale that was given to carers to fill up. And we found that at four months post-training, they had an improvement in their activities of daily living. And uh, so that was quite promising. And we also found that they also had an improvement in their hand function. So usually quite a lot of our neglect patients will also have a condition called hemiparesis. So their hands will be kind of paratic, even though, you know, uh, physically the arm and the hand is actually fine. It's just the connection with the brain that is impaired after the stroke. And uh, we found that the patients or their carers reported that they started using their hand more, again, four months post-training. So this was a small trial, of course, but it's quite promising because we found that our results show that uh, their neglect improves, but also there's a carryover to other tasks like, you know, visual search and ADL, activities of daily living and function, which are there even four months after the training. Wow, that's re- that's really nice. I, I really like how simple the tech is for it. It sounds like it's something to be very usable and you're right, uh, low cost too. So, Yes, yeah. quite portable. Obviously, you know, it's not going to work for every patient again. So what I would like to do, so working on grant applications just now, is to do larger trials in which we can actually pinpoint for which patients the treatment will actually work. So that's really important. I don't want to promise here that this is a cure for neglect, in essence. Yes. <laughs> I'm putting my caveat here. <laughs> yeah. Well, along with that one you just mentioned, what are some of the other things you're currently working on or planning? Yes, so we're doing a lot of different things at the moment. So we've done us some studies on looking, uh, again, very similar to the patient DF study. We're trying to understand what kind of actions, again, the neglect patients are impaired. So we've done a single case study, which I'll be talking about soon at a conference, looking at peripheral reaching, so very much like the optic ataxia diagnostic task. I'm also interested in when actions have competing motor plans. So I've been uh, doing some work on bimanual actions and neglect in patients who don't present amiparesis because I think that's quite interesting to see because in our daily life, we actually use both hands, not just one. We're also looking at in the lab at in, uh, trying to understand more about this interaction between the two streams. So we're using functional magnetic resonance imaging at the moment 
to look at the overlap or difference between viewing pictures of objects and pantomiming the use of these objects. So going back to Gibson's kind of theory that a graspable objects afford certain actions and automatically potentiate uh, action plans in our brain. So we're kind of looking into this in the lab. And as I said earlier, in the future, I'd like to run multi-site clinical trials, compare different treatments of neglect, and try and understand a bit more about how these patients recover in time. So because some patients will actually spontaneously recover. So what's the difference between the patients who recover and the patients who don't? And what treatments should we use for different types of patients? Yeah. Well, this was great. I really enjoyed this, Stephanie. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Thanks very much, Rob. Thanks again for the great discussion, Stephanie. It sounds like you have a lot of exciting research plans, so I look forward to seeing what comes next. You can find out more about Stephanie from the links I've posted in the show notes and follow her on Twitter at Stephanie Rossett. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. Jesus came, gone